Hi folks, this is a video on sea level change and how this affects the coast and the types of coastal features that are there. This links into our third inquiry question, how the coastal erosion and sea level change alter the physical characteristics of coastlines and increase risks. We're going to be thinking particularly about sea level change because it does have a huge effect on the coast. Sea level change can come about for various reasons. But the first thing to remember is that sea level can go up or it can go down. It can go either way. So when we're thinking about um, classifying coasts, we can classify them as emergent or submergent. They're either coming out of the water or they're going into the water. This diagram here, the Valentin diagram, shows that coasts can either expand outwards or expand upwards, can retreat backwards or retreat downwards. That's what that means. If it's going into this zone, it's disappearing. If it's in this zone, it's appearing. If it's appearing, it's emergent. If it's disappearing, it's submergent. So emergent, it's emerging. Submergent, it's submerging. Make sense? And sea level change is not a simple thing. It can occur in many different ways, in many different locations, uh, and many different times. So we're going to break it down into different types of sea level change. We're going to break it into eustatic sea level change, that's E-U-S-T-A-T-I-C, and isostatic, I -S -O S-T-A-T-I-C, sea level change. Isostatic means that the land is moving up or down within the water. So the amount of water in the oceans is staying the same, but the land is moving relative to the water. The amount of water is staying the same. Iso means the same. Isotonic would be a drink that has the same salt and sugar balances your body. Isobar is a way of measuring pressure, but it shows the same amount of pressure somewhere. Isotope, two um, atoms with, uh, that are the same atom type, but different variants of it. So iso means the same. The amount of water is staying the same, and the land is moving relative to the water. Eustatic is where the amount of water globally is going up and down. So the sea level is changing rather than the amount of land. So the sea quantity is changing rather than the land. So eustatic change is where water is coming in or out of the system. Isostatic change is where the land is moving up and down. Why might this be? Well, on a submergent coast, so where the land is, uh, or where the sea level is rising relative to the land. First off, we can be thinking about ice melt. Ice is melting from glaciers, it's filling up the oceans. So there's more water, so all the continents are going to uh, experience some sea level rise. That accounts for about 40% of sea level change, and it's what's happening at the moment with climate change. There's also thermal expansion. Water, like metal or many other um, substances, expands when it gets warm. So the water is actually expanding. Not only is there more of it, but as our Earth's temperatures are increasing, the amount of water um, is increasing, but also it's expanding in size. And that accounts for 60% of eustatic sea level rise. The same is true in reverse. So if we're looking at sea level regression rather than sea level transgression, transgression is where it's going up. Regression, sea level is going down, so we're getting an emergent coast. This could be the Earth's getting colder and more ice is being trapped within glacial, glacial features, glaciers. And also thermal contraction. If the Earth's getting cooler, the oceans will shrink. So these two are 
opposites of the same effect. The amount of water that's in the sea is either rising or falling. And if the sea level is falling, the amount of ice is rising. And this brings us on to isostatic change. And we're going to start with regression. So an emergent coast. Why might the coast be popping up? This is something called post-glacial isostatic adjustment. Ice is incredibly heavy. Water, if you take a cubic metre of water, that weighs a tonne. Ice, slightly less dense than water, but it's nearly a tonne. So one cubic metre of ice is a tonne. If you think about thousands and thousands of miles of ice sheet, that weighs an almost inconceivable amount. When all that ice melts, the rock actually lifts back up like a weight being taken off a, of a sponge or something that's sort of flexible. So as the weight is removed, because the glaciers are melting, the land rises up out the sea. Remember, this is isostatic, so the amount of water is not changing, the land is rising up out of the sea. And that's called post-glacial isostatic adjustment happened in the most ice-covered areas, and that's why Scotland is rising up out of the sea. Scotland will rise again. On the other hand, though, in some areas we're getting accretion of sediment. Now, accretion is where uh, sediment from rivers and other fluvial systems is flowing down to river deltas, where they meet the sea, in the estuaries, in the salt marshes. You saw the previous video, if you haven't. Watch it. But the sediment is loading up, it's building, it's building, it's building. It actually pushes down, the weight of all that sediment pushes the land down into the sea. It causes crustal sag. So what we're seeing is that actually a lot of it's related to ice and to river processes. The more ice there is, there's less water in the oceans, but in some areas that ice is going to press the continents down. Less ice means more water in the oceans, but also means more rivers, so you might have some areas that are being pushed down by sediment. It's, it's all to do with this dynamic equilibrium idea that we've been talking about through all these videos. Everything's always moving. And the height of the sea level is going to affect the kind of erosion and deposition processes that go on. Because more of the land that's in the water, the more processes are going to be occurring. Also, if you've got one end of the land dipping down seaward and one end dipping landward, that's also going to affect it. Watch the uh, previous videos if you're unsure about how those have effects. So always round, sea level is a massive, massive issue. Uh, and one of the biggest problems, of course, is that our sea level is rising because of, of cl our climate changing. Our climate's getting warmer, the sea level is eustatically rising, but also that reduction in ice is affecting isostatic sea level change as well. So on emergent and submergent coastlines, you come across various features. On an emergent coastline, so where you're seeing sea level regression, dropping down, you basically get a whole coastal landscape which pops up out at sea. And so you get these slightly strange looking features where it's like there's cliffs on a beach with no coastline. The active beach is down here, but as it's popped up out the ocean, the sea level has retreated back along the coast and it's left an old beach and an old cliff um, which had been formed when the sea level was higher, when the sea was up here because it's dropped down, it's now down here. So you've got an active beach down here and fossil cliffs and a raised beach over here. You particularly see them in Scotland. Um, they do look a bit strange. Uh, but it does mean that there are a lot of, um, a lot of plants that grow in the raised beaches and on the fossil cliffs, so it's very good for succession. Check out the succession video if you haven't already done so. 
In terms of submergent features, basically imagine any landscape that's been flooded. River valleys, you get rias. Okay, R I A S. You get a lot of these in Cornwall. Um, there are creeks and things that come about because the river valley has been flooded with water. So you get like sort of an expanded kind of salty set of, uh, of inlets. Very good for smugglers. Um, hence a lot of um, a lot of smuggling going on in Cornwall. Fjords are if you've got a glacial valley, a U-shaped valley rather than the V-shaped valley that you get from rivers. If they've been flooded, get lots of them in Norway. Very spectacular because you get very steep sides and then a big expanse of water. And as mentioned in an earlier video, you can get Dalmatian coasts. These are where you've got folding from collision boundaries and then the sea has flooded into the dips in the uh, in the folds in the folds sorry and that creates a dalmatian coast but check out the other video if you don't remember that one all of these come about from sea level change so you've got old coastal features popping up or old features being pushed down into the water. A final submergent feature is the Barrier Islands landscape. We're a little unsure about how these are formed, um, but you tend to find them in areas such as Florida. The Florida Keys are all barrier islands. A lot of these coast to the US, in fact. There is some suggestion that it is in fact sand dunes, old sand dunes and cliffs which have submerged and the sea has come in between the dunes. It's a little difficult to tell, but they do appear to form an old barrier that would have been there before. Regardless, they're a submergent feature, particularly in the USA, and they're quite extensive, they're quite long, uh, long ranging. Now, sea level change can lead to different rates and types of erosion. And so um, it is very much linked into changes in the sediment cell. Watch the previous video if you don't remember the sediment cell. But basically, it changes where the stores and where the sinks are. However, I want to just add a little bit on about how actually we can uh, be responsible for doing some of that damage ourselves. It is not always to do with the dynamic equilibrium in nature. We have a tendency to mess things up ourselves. In the 1890s, in a town known as Hall Sands, there was a beach, fishing town, everyone was happy. However, the sand started to disappear and began to erode away reducing the amount of defence that the town had from the sea. So the sand started to work its way away. And the beach profile changed. It became a lot steeper. Now as we know steeper beach profile becomes more destructive. The waves became more destructive and in a particular storm um, in 1917 all but one of the houses in the town was left uninhabitable because of the destruction caused by the waves. It now exists as a ghost town on the Dorset coastline. So what happened to Hall Sands? Very simple. Offshore Dredging was occurring, i.e. boats were going out and digging up the sand and they were using it further down the coast. But they changed the sediment sink by digging out sediment down at the bottom 
and hauling it away. They were changing the sink. They changed the equilibrium of the coast. And it caused destruction at this point. So it's not just natural processes, but also human processes that um, can end up changing the, uh, the sediment cell and affect that dynamic equilibrium. Anyway, that's all of the uh, information on sea level change, plus this little addendum. If you've got any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching. Hi folks, this video is on the effects of erosion on the physical landscapes um, on coastlines um, and it's a complement to the previous video on sea level change. And in the last video I mentioned Hull Sands at the very end uh, because I wanted to introduce that uh, as a transition <coughs> Hi folks, this is a video on uh Hi folks, this is a video on how coastal landscapes are affected by erosion. It's a counterpart to the video I did on sea level change. Now at the end of the video on sea level change I talked about whole sands, where the beach was removed, it affected the sediment cell, and it led to a town being destroyed. However, it's not quite as simple as that, because erosion is a combination of physical and human processes. So before we start thinking about these, we need to think about the risk factors. What is it that leads to greater erosion rates? linked into the sea level changes, what else have we got? You are at risk um, of greater erosion if there's a long fetch, so a very long distance that the waves are travelling, if they are destructive waves, if the waves are 90 degree perpendicular to the coast, so if they're destructive and they're slamming straight into it, that also puts them at risk, because there's going to be more erosion happening at that stage from those destructive waves. However, strong uh, longshore drift, which comes from very diagonal waves, is also a risk. So the strong, um, those strong movements cause the sediment to be moved away very, very quickly. So strong LSD is definitely a risk. seaward dip of the rock is tilted towards the ocean, more chance of erosion going on. Faulting in the rock as well, if it's weaker in some way, uh, but also the geology and the lithology. So the type of rocks and the nature of those rocks, all of these are risk factors. Human factors, though, also come into play. Dredging, so removing sediment from the sediment cell, is going to change the way that the erosion works. And damming, if you take the River Nile, the Aswan Dam blocked the River Nile and it reduced the amount of sediment that got into the ocean, which had massive effects further down the coast. So I mention hall sands. Well, down on Dorset, very long fetch. Destructive waves from the change in the beach profile. Not so much the 90 degree box, but uh, waves, sorry, but strong longshore drift, removing the sediment very quickly. So a very quick change in the dynamic equilibrium. The dip of the rocks less important, but 
Um, the, uh, the rocks themselves, uh, because of the geology and the lithology, were quite steep, steep cliffs. So, not very much um, steepness in the beach profile to dissipate that wave energy. The energy of the waves is dissipated if you've got a long beach. So shortened beach profile, steep cliffs, more energy hitting hall sands. And of course, all of this came from the dredging, digging up the sediment cell. Damming, not so much an issue here. But the point is, hall sands is a mixture of all of these things, all of these human and physical factors coming together to cause a submergent, retreating coastline, going down, but also retreating back. Now erosion rates change according to time and also according to space. So there are variations between summer and winter erosion. Winter storms tend to lead to more destructive waves just because of the nature of the oceans and also um, because of the nature of winter and temperatures the rocks tend to be weaker, more chance for freeze, thaw, weathering and other uh, weathering processes. Storms and wind direction change over time as well. So one day it might be calm, another day it might be stormy. One day the wind's coming from one direction, another time it's coming from another direction. This will change the direction of longshore drift, it'll change whether the waves are coming in at an angle or perpendicular, so how much energy is being dissipated. But also, spatially speaking, beach shape makes a difference. And I want to mention, although this is going over quite a lot of stuff we mentioned in another video, I want to mention ords at this point. Ords are big hollows in the beach. And they seem to focus erosion onto particular areas because they're deep. Um, they seem to allow destructive waves to get in, which is like a big hole in the beach, basically. You get them especially on the Holderness coast. Ords move around, they move out to sea and they move along the beach, but where they are you're going to get more erosion. So there are many factors that lead to different types of erosion and it leads to a constantly changing set of landscape features. It's not always erosion that puts an area at risk. Sea level change and other factors can also affect coastal flooding. Now some areas are much more at risk of coastal flooding than they are of erosion. Basically, a coastal plain or any flatter area is most at risk of coastal flooding. Less likely to be an erosion risk, although there, there may be, due to the factors we mentioned before, some changes in erosion patterns, either short term or long term. But coastal plains tend to be depositional features, they tend to be low energy coastlines. So it's more about the flooding that's the risk. Coastal plains such as the east coast of the USA uh, are very much at risk. Estuaries as well, like the Thames estuary where rivers meet the sea, they tend to be flatter because rivers flatten out the landscape at estuaries. And also river deltas. So deltas such as the Nile Delta, the Ganges Delta in Bangladesh is particularly at risk, very, very vulnerable. The reason is that actually a lot of people live in these areas. Coastal plains are very good for tourism. Estuaries are very, very good for trade. And deltas are very fertile soil, hence the Nile, um, and people living there in Bangladesh. So, but they're greatly at risk, so people are taking a huge risk by living there. Facts that affect coastal flooding are height of the land, higher it is, less chance of coastal flooding. Makes sense. Subsidence. Has the land sunk down? So height is like the natural height of the land, but there's also, has the land subsided because of isostatic sea level change. 
Maybe it's subsided because of eustatic sea level change, sea level rising up, which we'll come back to. Vegetation. If the vegetation is there and it's not been removed, then that's going to uh, dissipate some of the effects of flooding because the vegetation will not only absorb some of the wave energy as it's coming in, but it will also soak up some of that water and retain it like a sponge. So vegetation, not only good at preventing erosion, good at preventing flooding. Storms and storm surges. We will come back to in a moment. The sea level rise and climate change are big issues. Eustatic sea level rise or isostatic sea level rise. But climate change is very unpredictable. We don't know what's going to happen. But we do know ice is melting, sea levels are rising, and that's going to lead to more flooding. Now storms and storm surges are slightly more complicated. You don't need to know the in-depth processes for coasts as to why a storm causes a surge. If you do want to find out more though, check out my video on depressions, because that will explain that, but that's a different matter. What happens is a storm creates low pressure. It basically sucks the air up from below and it rises up in anti-clockwise spinning motion. It doesn't have to be a tornado to do this. Any storm will release the pressure. And if you release pressure, take away the air because it's rising up, the water bulges up to fill the space. So as a storm moves across the ocean, it carries water with it. So it carries this bulge, almost like a tsunami. And so a big storm will pull a big bulge of water in and it'll create a surge. It'll create a temporary rise in sea level that can flood a location. There have been some areas that have been very uh, much at risk of this. We get it quite a lot in the North Sea. There was a very famous one in the 1950s. There was also one in 2013. We get them quite a lot. And due to climate change, or we assume due to climate change, the evidence is pretty much there, it seems to be happening more and more. So, these uh, coastal plains are at much higher risk, and these factors tend to lead to more flooding. So, we've looked at how coastal erosion, sea level change alter the physical characteristics of the coast. It's all linked in again to this dynamic equilibrium. It's all linked into the idea that the coast is dynamically changing through time and space. If you've got any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.